And so um, just to, to begin, my name is Carolina Perez. I am a ministry coordinator at DePaul University. And so the, our division is actually the Division of Mission and Ministry, and I'm within the Catholic Campus Ministry. And I help with faith formation, retreats, and Latinx ministry. So with our Latino Latina young adults, and it is a pleasure to be here moderating this panel of these wonderful, influential young adults from across the globe. They are changing the church like you, you don't even know. So I, I feel very honored to be here and to introduce these wonderful folks that we have here. And so as, as you see in the chat, just some reminders. Uh, Sofia Gutierrez posted a message. If you can all uh, read that, participants um, can use the chat, but you cannot interact with one another. And if you have, need any help, Sofia is the person to, to reach out to for that. So now we will begin. First of all, um, the three participants, our three panelists, are Emil Abouchard, so Ag Agatha Natania, and Brenda Noriega. And right before uh, I introduce them one by one, they have actually brought a video with them. They would like to introduce the Vatican International Youth Advisory Body with a video. It is a short uh, two minute video. And so we will get ready to show you all that video so we can get started with our panel. Thank you so much, everyone. A body has 10 fingers and 10 toes, all equally useful and all part of one body. One finger alone is such a normal part of the body and cannot do anything on its own. But if you put it together with your other fingers, that's a whole different story. These fingers are made to work, to walk, to pray, to share, and to love. Our fingers are one of the best ways to connect with the world, and they are not afraid to get dirty. The International Youth Advisory Body has 20 members. Each member is an important part of the body. Like fingers, each member is a young person who in his or her life has chosen to follow the Lord and become a little holier every day. Well, while we share some of our photos with you, we would like to tell you one thing we have learned in this year we have spent together. We are just fingers, I'm sorry. We are normal young people the Lord has called for this service, not to revolutionize the church, but to walk together in humility and in a profound synodal spirit. As St. Paul said to the Corinthians, many parts, one body. 20 fingers and toes together in one body. 20 young people together form the first international youth advisory body. A body has 10 fingers and 10 toes. A body. Wow, what a creative video. I am very surprised at how catchy that is. 10 toes and 10 fingers. What a wonderful surprise. Thank you so much for creating that video and inspiring us to remember that we are one. And so with that being said, we will start with Agatha Natania. She is a young peace builder from Indonesia who is passionate about conducting intercultural and interfaith programs. With 10 years of experience in this field, she has conducted and participated in national and international events aimed at promoting tolerance and youth development. She serves as executive director of AYO, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, Youth Organization, which is the largest youth-led organization in Southeast Asia, promoting youth development in the region. Agatha has a background in international relations, 
She has led regional youth programs and has been invited to speak at international events related to youth inclusion, youth empowerment, and intercultural and interfaith dialogue. In November of 2019, she was appointed to the International Youth Advisory Body, established by the Vatican Dicastery for Laity, Family, and Life. She is also translated Christus Vivi into Bahasha Indonesia, allowing its message to spread among Indonesian youth through dialogue workshops and digital content. Agatha, take it away. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, Carolina, and a very good um, evening, almost midnight from Indonesia. Such a pleasure to be here. Uh, first, I want to also uh, give a big shout out to my dear friends, Brenda and Emil. It's such a pleasure to be with uh, the two of you also. And thank you so much to the, the Paul University, to Karen and Marlon for this opportunity. Allow me to share my screen and I will be delivering a presentation um, with the title of Young People and the, and the Church, A True Journey of Walking Together. So as Carolina introduced me earlier, my name is Agata Lydia Natania from Indonesia. You can call me Agata. And um, actually, I want to start this um, presentation with a quote from Pope Francis. And this is a quote that he delivered during the World Youth Day Panama in 2019 where he said, you, dear young people, are not the future, but the now of God. I was there in, the, in Panama City when Pope Francis delivered this in the homily, and it was an incredible feeling because it struck me really hard that it's actually true that the young people are not only preparing themselves for the future, but they are also matter right now really in the present today so um, it's a very important message and uh, when when i heard this message i'm very determined to you know spread this message to a lot of people especially the young people and to um, give them the trust and to ensure them that we we matter the young people we have our voices like our works matters not only for the future but also now so in my presentation in the next uh, maybe 15 minutes, I will be delivering a presentation about young people and the church. And I want to focus on the true journey of walking together and why I chose a true journey because in walking together, we have a lot of uh, things that might be happening, a lot of challenges, a lot of opportunities also, but what does it mean to walk together? So in this um, presentation, I want to explore the three areas in, on, based on inclusion, synodality, and accompaniment. But after sharing with you the, the, the title, I want to also begin with the realities, and then I will continue with these three aspects and um, end with the conclusion. So, and um, these are the realities uh, that I want to share with you all. First is that I believe it's um, not a good thing to overgeneralize young people by saying that, oh, young people, they don't want to be involved in the church or they, won't, they just want to leave the church. But also it's not true by saying, oh, young people are very involved in church. So these are, there is the, uh, a big homework actually to, to see further how are the realities of today's uh, relation between young people and the church. And for today's um, discussion, I want uh, you, I want us to focus on these two aspects on why young people, some young people want to separate themselves from the church and why are some of them, they want to involve more or want to be engaged more with the church. And based on my studies and also personal experiences, these are several factors that can influence the young people to be close or to be, um, you know, drifting apart from the church. The first category is on socioeconomic condition. We see a lot of young people, for example, when they have problems with their finance, they have problems with their social environments or surroundings, sometimes they just 
they they want to be separated from the church. However, seeing at the other side of the mirror, there are also young people who are sad because of the condition, but they still want to be engaged with the church. And also, it uh, it applies with the disruption of the pandemic. We can see a lot of young people. They they believe that they don't have to go to the uh, physical mass anymore because they can go to the church by looking at the screen. And also with technological advancement, um, you know, the presence of social media, it really affects how young people want to be involved with the church. The second category is on the young people themselves. They are in the process of searching for their identity. They are still not sure with their depth of spirituality, and also their they have their personal positive or negative relations with the church. So these are just some several factors that I want to point out um, to have a background of what are the realities of young people um, and the church today. And this is also one of the reason why young people, they really want to be involved with the church because they believe that despite all of these factors, all of these challenges, they still know that they have the energy they want to contribute to the church and they want to be part of the solutions. They don't want to be just part of the problem. So how do we want to walk uh, together with the young people and how can the church walk together with the young people? So the first aspect that I want you all to um, take a look at is on the aspect of inclusion. What does inclusion mean? Inclusion in short means leaving no one behind or include um, involving a lot of people despite of their backgrounds, their conditions. And this is also one of the advocacy that young people are saying in their um, in their life, in their political uh, engagements, or in their activities, but also in their activities within the church. They want to be involved, they want to be engaged. That's why in working together with the young people, it's very, very important to include them. And how to include them? First, it's very important to include them also in the formal process. You can see on the first picture on your left side, it's actually a picture of um, some of us, like there was me and Joseph from Canada, and we participated at the group discussion on the opening of the Synod last um, October in Rome. And this is one of the aspects or the truth of the true meaning of inclusion to bring the young people involved in the, in the Synod process, not to just see it from far, but also to be part of the discussion. It was an incredible, incredible feeling because in this discussion, Joseph and I can be part of the discussion and have this conversation with the cardinal, with the priest, with the representative from the lay people. This, this is like the real engagement of the synodal process and we are very grateful of this. The second one is to also include young people in a lot of activities, not just as beneficiaries. There are a lot of in, um, events or maybe programs directed for young people, but are these programs are also like being um, created with the young people. So by this inclusion, I meant that the young people should also be involved in the planning process, in the implementation, and also evaluation process. For example, if you if um, the church or in this case, like in our particular churches, in our dioceses, in our parish, uh, parishes, if we want to create programs, like we involve young people to to discuss what are the problems that we want to solve, what kind of programs that the young people need, not to assume but to ask directly with them. And in the second picture, you can see these are um, this was the event the international youth forum and we were writing a letter to pope francis so we are included in the in the um, in the activities to also having a direct uh, conversation with the pope and it was an incredible also implementation of the aspect on inclusion the last one is on dialogue it's also very important to have a continuous dialogue with the young people to see what, how are their conditions about their realities and how we can walk together better with the young people. It needs dialogue, not just uh, based on paper research. 
Uh, and on inclusion, another important milestone is on the Synod on Young People, the Faith and Vocational Discernment in 2018. In this synod, it was very special because young people were involved in all the synodal process, the pre-synod, the synod, and also post-synod. This is also um, the exam a concrete example of inclusion of young people. I was fortunate uh, during the last um, uh, synod on synodality, I, I was given the opportunity to participate in the press conference. And I was I said that that the, young, that the young people should be in, involved, not only during the Synod on Young People, but also in other Synod and also in other promo process with the Vatican. And uh, this is uh, the picture of us, the International Youth Advisory Body. It's also the fruit of the Synod on Young People in 2018. And we are, uh, if you are wondering who we are, what we do, we are actually a consultative body to the Dicastery of Laity, Family and Life for the Vatican. So what is, what is like the good news about this is that this is the first time in the history of the church that the church has like an, a, a formal or official uh, representative of young people from different countries, different backgrounds, so that the church can also consult with the young people what are their realities, what are their um, challenges, and also how can the church can, can involve and be engaged with the young people then. So it, this is like a, the direct involvement with young people and with the hierarchy of the church. And uh, we really hope that this will be, we will not be the first one, but we will be like many um, direct involvement of young people in the international level as well. And the important message with this establishment of the youth advisory body is that the young people's voice are heard in the church and they are also empowered as the protagonist. In our meetings uh, with the dicastery, they really encourage us to take the lead, to be the protagonist, to give ideas, to give um, consultations on different matters, on the aspect of young people, um, synodality, on the dig digital world, on migration, and so on and so forth. We can be involved also to give our opinions and inputs on the dicastery's um, programs for the young people and also the policies, um, future plans, or current plans for the young people. And the next um, aspect that I want to also share with you is on the synodality. It's a very important aspect to walk with young people and the church is emphasized on the with. And to achieve this, it's very important to have um, an openness to participate in this journey together. With this openness, we Take, we, we throw away like the feeling of I am right, you are wrong, and so on and so on and so forth. But we are open to walk together, even though we may have like different knowledge or different priorities, but we are walking together and we want to be we want to embrace in this journey. So that's why openness is a very important aspect uh, when we are going to walk with the young people and also with the church. And in this walking together, we will often see uh, maybe different um, opinions, uh, arguments, but like with the spirit of openness, uh, we can walk together. The second important thing is to have a meaningful participation of young people instead of tokenism. I've witnessed there are so many events where young people are just uh, being um, invited so that they have representation of young people or they just care about, okay, we have young people, so then we have an uh, initiative for young people. It's not the story. Meaningful participation, meaning that the young people are really involved so they can share their opinions, they can be uh, engaged and, and involved uh, as, as much as they could by sharing their, um, by sharing their, their, their opinions as well, and also how they can contribute uh, with their gifts, uh, with their um, expertise in, in the programs. And it's also important to empower and trust young people to help to have leadership roles. This is still missing because um, uh, we see that uh, sometimes uh, the other generation, they feel they don't really want to give the opportunity for young people because they feel young people are inexperienced. 
on the other hand, uh, in working together with the young people, it's very important to trust them and to give them the room to make mistakes and give, to give them room to give, have this opportunity. But this is a continuous process of listening, sharing, and learning from each other. That's why it's important to have a dialogue and also promote tolerance during the, this journey. The last one is to address those uh, or to complete those two aspects is on accompaniment. So we still have a lot of gaps between the theory and practice. In theory, young people uh, should be given the opportunity, but in the reality, in the field, are they are given the room to speak out their mind or be involved. And another issue is that uh, sometimes we see there's a wall between young people and the hierarchy of the church. And as Pope Francis said in the opening of the Synod last year, this wall should be demolished. We should, we should not have these walls that separate us, but we have to be open to have this journey together. So accompaniment of young people is also very important because young people, like the others, we are still learning. So it's important to also have accompaniment from um, the consecrated ones uh, during our journey. And implementation of crisis vivid messages is also uh, very highly encouraged because in crisis vivid, there are so many beautiful messages that encourage for young people's participation and also calling the church to be young, calling the church to, be, to give the opportunity for young people to be involved more and to work together. And there's also a need for having room for reflection and sharing to improve the journey together. Because like us, the youth advisory body, it has been also a journey for us in finding how we want to work, how we can also be, um, how we can also contribute to the church. How can we meaningfully contribute and giving our participation within the church? It was also have been a journey for all of us. And the last one is to also utilize World Youth Day Momentum to empower young people in particular churches as witnesses of God. And during the World Youth Day, the young people are gathered so they can also have this experience of being closer to God. And we can use this opportunity to introduce to them um, about um, how they can be involved more, but also to, be, to give the, the opportunity for for the church to listen to them more and to give the, the room for young people to be involved more. So these are just uh, some um, topics that I wanted to throw first. And uh, these are my contacts. And later on, we can have a more in-depth discussion during the uh, Q&A session. So thank you so much for your attention. And over to you, Carolina. Hey, thank you so much. We really appreciate hearing you, Agatha, and it's truly inspiring to hear um, not just what you've done, but your perspective on church and God and God's people. So we appreciate all your work. Thank you so much. And up next, I would like to invite Brenda Noriega. She is a young minister committed to accompaniment and evangelization. She has been serving God's people and influencing her community since an early age at the parish diocesan, regional and national level. She earned a master's degree in pastoral ministries from the University of Santa Clara and collaborates on multiple national and international committees representing young people, including the International Youth Advisory Body for the ba Vatican Dicastery of Laity, Family and Life. She is passionate about holistic and transformational ministry, including life, dignity, justice, mission, and currently she is pursuing her PhD in theology and education at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry. Brenda, bienvenida. Take it away, please. Muchísimas gracias, Carito. Uh, it's a great honor to be among friends. Uh, this is honestly like a family reunion. It's great. And for those of you who I have not met, well, you're already a friend, right? We are all part of the Christian family and we are all family. We are all friends. We are all one. So this is great. It's great to be here with you guys. Um, I'm going to start sharing my, my presentation and I want to tell you that um, we, we've been asked to present also from our own personal realities and our experiences about the, the International Youth Advisory Body. And I want to speak about young people in synodality from the US perspective. 
So I'm coming in with all in my biases and with all in, in my information and my culture as a Mexican, um, as a Mexican, but also uh, as a person who has been in the US for a long time. So my apologies in advance if I say anything wrong or offensive, uh, but I, I want to present myself 100% as who I am. And that comes with all in, in my imperfections. So um, when we talk about young people in the United States and, and, and talking about solidarity, um, first, I want to clarify that in the United States, um, when we say young people, we actually refer to, to, we use two different terms that we use youth, and then we say young adults. So the youth for us is from the age of 13 to 17, and then young adults from 18 to 39. Probably in other countries, you're gonna be like, what? Over 30, you cannot be a young person. <laughs> but that is part of a reality. And we don't talk about ages, but we actually talk about life stages. So uh, and you can be married or single and still be considered a young person. That is very important because it has to do with who we consider young and how do we serve the young people. So during my short presentation, you're gonna hear me say young people. Um, and when I say young people, I'm gonna refer from like 13 to 39 and that huge bracket and that includes many, many different realities. Um, and then sometimes I'm gonna be very specific as in like, when do I mean youth? And so I mean more of teenagers. And when I say young adults, I mean uh, young people of 18 to 39 nine years old. Uh, let me introduce you a little bit about who the young people are in the U.S. and who we are. And, and, and maybe sometimes you read documents or watch, you know, YouTube videos or you hear from presenters, a reality that is very different um, to yours. And, and this is probably the reason why. And this is who we we consider young people and who do, when we say young people, when I say young people, this is who I have in mind. So I love numbers. So I'm gonna start with some statistics, but um, this is all from peer research. My, my, my statistics are gonna be from uh, peer research. And according to peer research, most post millennials, which we're talking about generation C, uh, are pursuing college currently. And a lot of those uh, generation C pursuing college or higher education have parents who already have a degree. So this is, speaks about the type of resources young people have access to in the United States, but also the type of inform information they, they have access to. Um, also, the same research says that with uh, when we talk about Gen Xers, I mean, Gen Zers, uh, Generation Z in the United States, um, most of the post-millennial are racial or ethnic minorities. So we're talking about a community that is highly diverse, in, amazingly diverse. We are not only talking about the Hollywood image of the United States, the Hollywood image of young people, but the young people in the United States are highly, highly diverse. And within that diversity, we have the Hispanic Latino young people uh, on the front row in terms of numbers. Uh, if you have not noticed by now, or you didn't notice in my introduction, I, English is my second language. You can hear it in my beautiful accent and in my skin color, my hair, you know, everything. I am Mexican. I was born and raised in Mexico and I came to the United States at the age of 17. And so a lot of people have been asking themselves, why is a Latina representing the U.S. in some international conversations? In fact, when I went to the Pocinado um, Forum, the Youth Forum, uh, Pocinado Forum in, in Rome, I, I was asked many times, like, don't you feel strange being Mexican and like representing the U.S.? And for me, it's like, of course not. This is my reality. And this is the reality of so many young people in the United States. We are immigrants or we come from parents who are or immigrant parents. And we do not see ourselves as one or the other, but we see ourselves as both. And we really live in an in-between, between cultures, between values, between uh cultural values, you know, social realities. And many times we're trying to navigate that in between, but for us, we are both. We, we are 100% from the US and we are 100% from the countries that we come. And for example, for me, I'm now a mix of, 
of my both places and in, in my both realities. Um, so like Hispanic Latino young people, one in four youth are Hispanic. This is huge because we're talking about that probably the, the future of the, of, of the Catholic church in the United States. And we, we can even dare to say present, uh, the present phase, the current phase of, of the Catholic phase in the United States looks very much like mine. And it sounds very much like, like me. Um, and that is a huge statement, but the statistics don't lie. Uh, Dr. Josman Ospino, who was presenting earlier, uh, in his research, he found out that 40% of all Catholics in the US are Hispanic or from Hispanic descent, out of which 50% are between the ages of 14 to 29 and 55 under the age of 14. And out of those, um, out of all those John Catholics, 85% of them are from between the ages of 14 to 17 were born in the US. So in fact, a lot of uh, Hispanic Latino John people don't even speak Spanish anymore. Uh, we were talking in the, in the previous panel, there was a conversation about culture and about rootness and being rooted in culture and being rooted in values. Uh, this does affect when it comes to the transmission of the faith for John people in the United States we need to consider about like what language do we are we going to deliver a message of um of the gospel we have to consider also the popular piety of of our pueblos originarios of our people uh, you know or countries of origin and those of our parents and so for us uh, the young people in the united states we are very diverse and we do see that as a positive trend uh we do not see um, diversity as something negative. And we actually have learned it's natural now for us to see, to have events in multiple languages. And it's also natural for us to have conversations and uh, considering different ethnic, uh, ethnic realities or cultural realities. And we said as something beautiful. Um, going a little bit or jumping a little bit into a current reality uh, that is not as great as diversity is the in huge, huge uh, increase on in mental health. Um, a CDC survey that was done just in 2021, I mean, we're talking about just uh, last year, found out that 37%, 37% of young people in the United States have experienced, and especially youth, youth have experienced mental health, um, mental health uh, issues and they have not felt well in the past six months or the past week before when the, when the study was, uh, was done. And out of those uh, young people, there is a huge difference between um, homosexual and heterosexual young people experiencing mental health crisis or uh, including between the mental health crisis, depression. Uh, it was found out that 64% of uh, heterosexual um, young people have more or are, are more propensed to mental health issues than 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 um, heterosexual. Sorry, sixty-four percent homosexual, thirty percent percent heterosexual, and it's also the difference with in gender. Um, women, girls, are more propensed of falling in, or at least during the research and in, in due to the pandemic, they were more propensed to to have mental health issues than it was to boys. 49% of women and versus 24% of men. And once again, these statistics do matter because it tells about what the young people are experiencing, who they are, and how can we bring Christ to them, meeting them where they are. And that is very important for us in the United States. Um, and when we do ministry in the United States or when we serve uh, in terms of faith to young people, we do consider the social realities. Um, Another study uh, shows that uh, Generation C is uh, going back a little bit to the positive, that they are more propense or, or more accepting of seeing uh, a direct correlation between climate change and human, and, and human activity. In other words, uh, the, both uh, millennials and Generation C are seeing that uh, climate change, it's a reality and it has to be, it, something has to be done 
And it is actually a personal individual decision to change something, not only at the structural level, at the systemic level, but also at the personal, uh, at the personal uh, level. And talking about young people being active and seeing these realities, global, climate change is not localized, it's global, right? But also the different um, social issues. Uh, there's a research that tells us that young people, uh, those ages between 18 to 39, and I want you to look at the arrow over here, um, are more willing to take action online. And in fact, just last year, they, um, they, were, more, they were willing and they took action showing their support for a cause online. And they also, uh, over like 54%, which you can see it on the second, on the second row in front of you, um, about the arrow over here, you can see the other arrow moving, 54% um, of young people in comparison to the other ages were more willing to talk to other young people about taking action for a social cause. So we are seeing a community, a generation of a generation of, of young people, a generation of Catholics who are more willing to look at a social action and even see it as a part um, of their duty as, as human beings. Now, I don't want to say as their duty as Catholics because I want to show a little bit of statistics about that a little bit later, which is very worrisome. Um, but yeah, so um, the same research tell, tell us that there is a grow um, of, of young people sharing social media and, and sharing their, their platforms or using their social media platforms to find other young people who think like them and who are willing to take action. Now, this is not such a, it's positive in the sense that young people are not waiting for structures to make the change or to call the shots. Young people are doing it themselves. They are finding each other and they are saying, who thinks like me? Who wants to make a change? Who wants to do this? Let's do it together. And they are not gonna wait. But on the other hand, it's a little bit concerning that they are finding only those who like the things they like and who, who think the way they do. Um, we're talking about tri tribalism in a way. Um, groups, you know, uh, being friends only with, with those that do not disagree with them. And, and in the same way, they take action only among others who take action. And I think from the Catholic perspective, this is very worrisome um, because we speak of, of, being, of being one in humanity with everyone. And we're, we speak of an imago Dei and every, every single person and not just on those who, who are like-minded, right? Um, but that is to keep in mind and keep in mind that young people are creating networks without where, where, waiting for structures. And in this, I think Paul Francis, um, Paul Francis tells us in Fratelli Tutti that we are really speaking in order to make a change, real change in society. And when it comes to real solidarity, we are speaking about a new network of international relations. Since there is no way to resolve the serious problems of our world if we continue to think only in terms of mutual assistance between individuals or small groups. So we see a positive trend among young people willing to form these networks uh, locally or internationally. Um, but we see the negative aspect of, or challenging, not negative, challenging aspect of inviting young people to see beyond what they like. So keep this in mind. Um, when it comes to forming international relations, I want to say that the, the Synod on Young People and the process, better say the process that took place for the Synod on Young People had as an objective to form these networks, uh, international networks. And in fact, we did. We started by meeting each other back in 2018 um, when to have about uh, don't even remember the, the, the number of, of the auditors, but all this huge uh, amount of auditors of young people came to be in dialogue with the Synodal Fathers in 2018. And they became so close because they spent time together for almost a month that the relationship didn't end in that day, it continued. And then between 2018 in 2021, we had in 2019, the post the Youth Post-Synodal Forum, which, um, Emil, 
uh, Agatha and I were part of. And in that Positional Forum, it was 250 young people. And we were talking about Christos Vivid and the different topics that Pope Francis talks on Christos Vivid, the different themes. And one of those themes that came up eh, almost uh, unanimously, you know, there was a concern was migration. The fact of migration, the people, uh, young people leaving their countries and going to other places, young people dying on the road of migration, but also the lack of resources and the lack of unity among Catholic groups and organizations and the, and, uh, the network between places of of um, of arrival and, and places of departure. And Pope Francis talks about this in Christus Vivid section three. And this was a huge concern for over 250 young people around the globe. When we left that meeting, we created, of course we created a WhatsApp group. <laughs> Actually not when we left, but the moment we were there, uh, we created a WhatsApp group. We chose to enter into relationship with each other. We chose to continue hearing from each other's realities. And we chose to continue in dialogue and not only in dialogue, but finding ways of connections and finding ways of helping each other. And so in this WhatsApp group, you constantly see people asking for prayers, asking for financial resources, asking for, for help. Um, and it's just beautiful. We have not waited for any organization to do it for us, but we have taken the initiative. What, what was provided to us was a space to speak up. And we are very appreciative, not only with the dicastery of uh, Lady and Family Life who provided that space for us to speak up, you know, but also with Pope Francis creating a, a, an entire process of a synodal process for young people in which we young people were part of the conversations and we were making decisions. And as Agatha explained already, we, uh, 2019, we were selected, 20 of us, to continue the dialogue because the young people themselves told us in other fathers that we didn't want the dialogue to end at the end of, of the synodal process. And so they put it on the final document. And just a few months after that, it was announced that the, the committee was going to be formed and we were going to continue in conversation and dialogue. And that has been in 20, 2021, we finally met, we finally came together in Rome last year and we met in person, but we have been collaborating online for two years. We've been connected to WhatsApp. And so we've been a strong network. Um, we don't rely anymore, I will say, that 20 of us just on international news, but we rely on the personal experiences of each other. And I think that's what Pope Francis keeps talking about, the importance of forming structures that go beyond charitable char, char, charity, that goes beyond charity, and it actually uh, gives uh, structural foundations uh, of change. And so we have realized that relationships matter. We cannot care deeply about the other if we don't know their story. We don't know where they come from. We don't know their hopes and their challenges. And I will say that the International Youth Advisory Body, as well as the, the pre-synodal conversation, the synodal conversation, and the post-synodal conversation on young people, have opened these spaces to, to build relationships. Um, and I'm going to move forward due to time. But um, in Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis also says that solidarity means much more than engaging in sporadic acts of generosity, as I have mentioned before. And here I want to open my heart and, and tell you a very personal story of mine that on how the, the process of the Sina has changed my life. Um, but also in 2019, I had the, the, the huge blessing of having lunch with Pope Francis and, and nine other friends, among them Emilda and Father Joe, who was telling us about Emilda. And I have to give witness that everything he said is true. Um, she was a, a true gift in that conversation and in her witness. And in fact, we also build, we also have a WhatsApp group <laughs> for that group of people that we continue you being in conversation and in, and, and in dialogue. Um, as a young, as a young uh, woman, Latina immigrant coming from, from poverty, yes, but also um, being in the United States for so long, I came to the US right away, I got into school and I tried to adapt as fast as possible, almost a survival process. I had to survive and 
and it's dangerous how easy when we have a better life than the one we had, than the one we had is very easy to forget where we come from and to forget about the, the realities of, of other people around the globe. And so for me, um, it was a huge change in 2019 when I was invited to have lunch with 10 people at the table. And I had the privilege of being the translator, you know, because I'm fully bilingual. Uh, I had the privilege of being a translator since Pope Francis wanted to speak from his heart. He wanted to do it in Spanish and that was beautiful. Um, also it was being done in Panama. <laughs> but um, hearing from other young people at the table, when I went to Panama, my major concern was the well-being of the youth. I took 120 youth that I took um, to, to World Youth Day. And that is a huge concern. But my major concern even coming back to the US was um, the trip and making sure that nobody will get sick. And during the conversation, I heard different realities. Um, some young people being persecuted in their faith in their countries. Um, I did not get to experience that. Um, many young people having who are in that lunch who are in the midst of war, literally in the midst of war. And some young people were concerned going back to their countries that they were not even gonna be allowed to enter their country because um, they were in a Catholic, in a Catholic uh, public event and their countries are not too friendly with Catholicism or you know, faith. And so they were concerned about that. Um, and for me, that started changing my heart. But then at the Posinodo Forum, once I started hearing from 250 young people, the reality is multiplied. And it made me see how privileged I am. But then it also made me see that I was not doing enough when it comes to global solidarity, that my heart was still very close to actually be a real Christian and to go before just being generous, but to actually get involved in, in social justice and advocacy. And, and so I've been, uh, these encounters, um, these relationships, developing relationships have actually helped me to change my heart and my perspective. And many times we know the faith, we know Catholic social teaching, but the privilege that we experience, at least in the, in, in the United States, as I'm sure it is in many other countries, can blind us at times, um, regardless of faith. And moving forward, because I realize I'm really very behind with, with time, I just want to share how fraternity uh, once again, Pope Francis says that the responsibility of parents, caretakers, and educators extends also to the more moral, spiritual, and social aspects of life. The values of freedom, mutual respect, and solidarity can be handed on from a tender age. Communicators also have a responsibility for education and formation, especially nowadays when the means of information and communication are so widespread. Um, the statistics tell us in the United States that most of the youth share the faith of their parents or the lack of faith of their parents. But unfortunately, even if they share the faith of their parents, young people, who this is heartbreaking, young people between the ages of 13 to 17 don't think that faith or God or, or a belief in God is necessary for a good or a moral conduct. Um, so in other words, they do not correlate the belief on God or faith with good action and caring for others and especially caring even when it comes to global solidarity. Um, for me, that is concerning because Pope Francis tells that parents have the responsibility but also educators and social solidarity is part of our, of, of, you know, of our Catholic faith. And so how are we doing it? How are, and uh, my, my, my question here is how are our religious education processes, the schools and families and even campus ministry, ministries nourishing a sense of global belonging and solidarity? Because there is hope. We see now based on the statistics that, and you can see probably see the same trend in your countries, that young people do have a feel, a deep desire of community and a deep desire to care for the other and a desire for justice and a desire for solidarity. But how are we fomenting that? And we see young people creating their own networks, but how can we create Christian faith networks in which the Christian values 
are not being misinterpreted. Um, I think personally, the International Youth Advisory Body, it's a model for that. And I would just like close to, uh, would like to close with three learnings from the International Youth Advisory Bodies for me that has been a huge eye opening uh, through the process coming from, from the United States. And many times we like to think first on the end goal and, and, and the results before even thinking on the process. And so uh, being part of an international committee, being part of this beautiful network that I think we need more international youth advisory bodies, not just for the committee on, uh, for the dicastery on, on lady and family life or the dicastery on communications, but we need them in different, uh, in different sectors. We need them in different platforms and uh, three learnings that possibly others can, can get the same as we did uh, in, in this past three years. Number one, solidarity comes from relationships. Solidarity is not spontaneous. Um, it's based on relationships. It's about who you know. It's about knowing the stories of the people and relating to them. Empathy is not only always uh, a taken. Um, it really comes with time and it comes with nourishing those relationships. It comes with the time of listening and opening our hearts, but that takes time. Um, it has taken us three years to actually become a full family and to be happy when we see each other. Uh, two, unity and diversity does not mean homogenization. It doesn't mean but because we all in the advisory committee speak one language or have some beliefs, it means that we all do it together the same way. Let's keep in mind that Pope Francis said that the homogenization of young people is as dangerous, as dangerous as the extinction of a species. And so we have learned that in diversity, we also need to respect the cultural and social differences and even be mindful of the differences in language. And we learned that moving forward, moving forward doesn't always mean, um, I'm sorry, that moving doesn't always mean to move forward. Moving sometimes means to just stop and to be open to conversations. And sometimes moving also means to go backwards and to reflect on, on, the, on, on the way we are doing things. And finally, making the path by walking. When the International Youth Advisory Body was created, there was no objective exactly as in like what these 20 young people are going to do. It was, it was entrusted to us to decide what we wanted to do with that, what we wanted to do with the gift of community, with the gift of knowing each other's stories. Um, and so we need to learn to do that. Um, moving forward, we need to ask who is missing at the table. But we also need to let young people themselves to make those decisions. And, I, and Agatha mentioned uh, a little bit about that already. So I just was to close with this. Um, and I really hope that more spaces uh, across, <laughs> across the globe be open for more international youth advisory bodies. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Brenda. I really, really appreciate your insight, especially because you're representing uh, where I live and you're representing not just myself, but also uh, the young people that I serve. So thank you so much for your service and for your, your, wonder, your statistics as well. Very helpful. And now we will move on to our third and final panelist. Drum roll, please, for Emil Abouchad. <laughs> he is currently serving as a spiritual care practitioner at the Center Neuchâtel de Psychiatry Hospital in Switzerland. He is a 28-year-old Lebanese clinical pharmacist with a doctorate in pharmacy from St. Joseph University in Beirut. Active in the parish movement and dedicated member of the Maronite Church and Eastern Rite Catholic Church in full communion with the Roman Catholic Church, Abu Shad is committed to improving pastoral care in Lebanon for young people and medical patients. Since 2016, he has also served the young people of Antelias Maronite Diocese as chair of its youth committee, committee and as a volunteer in the patriarchal Curias Youth Ministry in Kirki. I hope I pronounced that right. In addition, he has participated in the 2018 and 2019 Synod on Young People's pre and post meetings. And in November of 2019, the Vatican Dyke Street for Laity, Family, and Life appointed him to its International Youth 
advisory body. Emil, take it away. Thank you, Carolina, and thank you, everyone. I'm so honored to be here, and I want to really thank the DePaul University for inviting us as representing the International News Advisory Body uh, here and to speak about um, our experience in this, uh, in this body and also in the experience from where we come and uh, what we do. Uh, I want to thank also Karen, Marlon, and everyone who, um, who is preparing and is preparing everything about this conference. And I'm so happy also to take part uh, of the discussion with Brenda and Akata, my friends and colleagues. So today I will be presenting um, the experience, the challenges, and the opportunities of young people in the Middle East. Actually, uh, because I come from Lebanon, um, I have a very big experience in the church there. So for me, it is really important to travel to this area of the world because we all know that this area, um, we have many conflicts and geopolitical issues and also uh, interreligious dialogue between Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. So it is really a unique mosaic as we, we know in this region. And it is important to be, um, to travel there to see how young people live there. What are the challenges? What are the opportunities? And what are uh, their experience? So the title of my presentation is rooted in our mission. We are the salt and the light of the Middle East. So uh, Carolina just presented me, so I won't be presenting myself in this presentation. I will be talking then in the, on the reality of young people in the Middle East, uh, their mission and their vocation, uh, the challenges that our church is facing concerning young Christians in the Middle East, and then uh, new perspectives that we can use so we can enhance their existence there and their mission and vocation. So as Carolina said, I am right now in Switzerland, but I come from Lebanon. I'm also an immigrant like Brenda. And I traveled to Switzerland because I found a job and because in my country, Lebanon, we are facing many economical and instability. Uh, so finding a certain, um, a certain um, pattern of stability outside Lebanon now is a must. But my desire is to return back to Lebanon because I know that I have a certain mission and vocation there as a young person, but also because Christianity cannot be empty from the Middle East. So this is a sort of uh, a vocation for me. And now it's temporary just to, to live and uh, to grow in, in my career. Um, so I participated in the pre and post synodal meeting in 2028 and 2029. So here you can see a picture with the uh, Middle Eastern group and here with all the people who are, who are who were coordinating the groups in the post synodal meeting. And it was a wonderful experience to sit for the first time in the church to ask for the young adults and young people to listen to them and to ask them what they want, what, their, what are their aspirations, what they want to do in life, um, what is their uh, vocation, et cetera. So it is something so, uh, for me, it's a, it's a miracle. And, um, and uh, the spirit is showing us that Christians, their voice, it's very important. So after that, I was nominated also among the IA, the International Youth Advisory Body. And this, these two pictures were taken in October 2021 when we met for the first time live in Rome. And it was a wonderful experience. And in the, in the IA, I always um, hold the voice or be the voice of the Middle Eastern young adults, and especially the people from the Oriental Orthodox and Catholic churches, because we live really as a one community in the Middle East, especially that um, being um, inside or facing or, um, or with many people from the other religions like Islam is something so important to also evangelize. So for me, it's, it's a vocation and it's a mission and to do it also in the Ayab and to be the voice, it's very important. So talking about the reality of young people in the Middle East, I can tell you that this area of the world where you have Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Lebanon, Palestine, Jordan, Iraq, Iran, 
uh, the UAE and um, the Saudi Arabia, the Yemen, the Oman, all these countries where Islam is the most as a, a religion, um, a religion uh, in this area. And so uh, the Middle East is a distinctive and special mosaic whose pieces are defined by the diversity of countries, cultures, ethnicities, languages, religions, and political regimes. In this area of the world, uh, women, uh, the, the, the role of the women in society is very controversial. We have political regimes that are uh, like dictatorate or uh, techno uh, or uh, theocrate regimes that are really sometimes uh, um, so bad for the for the for the population. We have three big religions, so they are in communication, but also fighting for their existence. We have many languages, many ethnicities, so it's really a diverse that can help young people to live, but also it can be a very big challenge because sometimes differences can be seen as a problem and we want as if, for example, Christianity is the truth or the Islam, et cetera. So it, it has many issues and many problems. So in this area, young people exist and um, uh, churches exist since the beginning of Christianity. Of course, as you know, in, uh, in Israel and Palestine, Jesus was born and he did his evangelization, uh, he, he pronounced the proclamation of the kingdom of God and all the disciples and they, they went from there. So these Christians or these churches are from um, the beginning of Christianity for uh, such as a syro Caldanian, Armenian, Syriac, the Maronite church and the Coptic church. I'm coming from the Maronite church that is only Catholic church. And also we have Protestants and evangelicals who came from the West. So there, there's no uh, Protestants and evangelical uh, that are local from the Middle East. And you have the MECC, that is the Middle East Council of Churches, that is a body that reunites all these churches together in a dialogue, ecumenical dialogue. What is common between us as Christians and the, and the Middle East is that we have the language, the same language as Arabic, it's the most common language, and Arabity is the cultural uh, identity of the majority of Christians in the Middle East. And some um, theologian or people who working in the church call us the church of the Arabs. And it is really a vocation and a mission to be the church of the Arabs because Arabs are not only uh, Muslims. There are Jews and there are Christians who are Arabs. And it's very important uh, to understand this, uh, this, this new significance of being an Arab. But young people in the Middle East have faced many problems. First, the Dimit and the Mila, it's like a re political regime when, uh, when we had the Jihad in the seventh century, for example, and it, it's still now, um, all the Christian communities have their own independence, but they also have um, a, a communication with other religions. We have uh, many conflicts and we faced many conflicts, the, the conflicts that led us to refugees and to uh, immigration. Like for example, the war in Palestine that has not been, uh, that has not finished till now. We don't have peace in the Middle East. In Lebanon, we had a 15 years of civil war that led to Christians to leave the country. In Iraq, in Syria, in Yemen, where Christians were attacked and were persecuted by the ISIS and by the, all the Islamic radicals. So we find refugees around the world in the West, in, the, in Europe, or even in the Middle East, for example, people who come from, um, from Iraq, Syria, and Yemen to Lebanon. But also we have uh, immigrants who, who actually leave the Middle East because it's unbearable to, li to live there for their faith and for their Christian identity. So we all are searching for stability and security and for better economical status. And this is uh, what we are facing right now. And it's a big problem. However, we know that um, uh, we have a certain vocation to be there and to, to stay in, in the Middle East. Because first of all, um, Christians are the church of God at the heart of the Arabness. So uh, we integrated Arab culture and shaped it with the color and fragrance of the gospel by our contribution to its development through the centuries, through art and literature. So you can find that 
the most uh, famous um, Arabic, for example, TV shows or uh, newspaper, etc., are from Christian communities who took really uh, serious the Arabic language and to, to, to read it in the color and the fragrance of the gospel. And this is something amazing because we are called by this language to evangelize this region. And this is uh, really a big mission. And it's not easy to do it because we are with another religion who totally think something else about God. So for example, here you have UCAT, we translated it in Lebanon to all the Middle Eastern uh, uh, Christian communities in Arabic. You have here the Holy Bible in, in, um, in Arabic. It's, it's really something very nice. And all the Christian hymns also, we have translated them and we do it in, um, so, we, so we can evangelize in all uh, this region. Second of all, as a mission and vocation, we have a contextualized theology. It means that people, uh, young people in the Middle East are really want to promote peace and want to promote the values of the word of God. So for example, they want to create a certain theology on violence, on immigration, on martyrdom and social injustice. And this is something so important because facing uh, the Palestinian cause and uh, the Iraqi and Lebanese and Syrian populations who are in uh, times of trial by war and violence, facing these issues and like dealing with them needs a certain theology that is um, that can be contextual for our uh, now. So um, for the present, and this is something important because the only way to be talking the word of God in the language that is understandable to all the population and to be promoting peace is to have a certain inculturation of the Bible among us in this region. So this is a second thing that is a mission and vocation for the young people. The third thing we see as young people, Christians, that Islam is something so positive because building bridges with another religion is like doing as the same experience of the disciples in the Bible. For the first disciples who were building bridges with Judaism, but also with paganism with the Roman empire. So we are living uh, somehow the same experience and it's not something so easy, but it is something also called by God, because if you want to be the church of the Arabs, and if we are here to stay, and if we are here to evangelize this area, we need also to communicate with Islam and to have a renewed look at Islam. So we lived there for more than 14 centuries with Muslims, and this common life has led to differences to the dialogue of life. We had moments of conviviality, sharing, partnership, alongside with critical controversies and unfortunate experience where hatred led to religious wars. For example, in Lebanon, we had 15 years of a religious war between Christians, local Christians in Lebanon and Muslims, especially the Palestinians. So it was really um, a very big problem for the communication. And now we are still living uh, the consequences of this war. But we can say that in some regions in the Middle East, this is um, this communication is is like uh, um, a sign of hope. So human fraternity, for example, that was signed by Pope Francis and Imam Al Azhar in Abu Dhabi, it was a sign of hope for all the Christians in the Middle East and young people especially, so we can have peace and uh, we can promote it easily in this region. Fourth of all, the courage to be a Christian in the Middle East and the effort of integration in the West. So Christians in the Middle East have, uh, are so open to the West and because they have a good relationship with the Occidental Church, that is the Roman Church, uh, uh, this communication and this dialogue that was had with the West was brought to the Middle East. So for example, uh, we can say in Lebanon, we speak French, we speak English, we speak Arabic, and we took all of this multicultural uh, way of living because the West is like this, for example. And we're not trying to take what is in the West and to come and to do it and to put it in the Middle East because um, um, we believe that we need to respect the local traditions, but this will make us uh, more open and to build bridges with the West. So many people also left the Middle East and the young people are building bridges with all these young people. For example, like me, as a young Christian who 
I left uh, Lebanon uh, for a contemporary right now. Uh, I always have communication with my friends and with my churches because these are my roots and I want it and I want to promote it wherever I go. And as a final thing in, uh, for example, here, for example, you have the American University of Beirut where evangelical and Protestant communities came to Lebanon to preach and to evangelize this area. And right now it's a, uh, it's a secular university, but it's very important for its uh, recognition as uh, in, the, in, in Lebanon and all people from Middle East come and study here. Um, as a final thing, we as uh, young Christians in the Middle East, we are the sign of hope. As you can see here in the picture, you have the Marinat Cathedral of Aleppo in Syria. It was bombed in the, um, in the war in 2013 in Syria. And now with the help of young Christians who are Maronite, they built it again because the Christian community is very important and the faith is very important in, in this region in Syria especially. So today, young Christians in the Middle East are a sign of hope for the church because we believe in the saints. We believe that we have the intercession of uh, Saint Mary. We have the faith and we love our savior. We love the identity and we, have the, we love the identity to be Christian. We are carried by the Holy Spirit to go against all the historical conflicts that led to war. And we believe in the power of the gospel. We want to build the church of God in a pre-religious context. We want to be the servants of peace. This is a theological and prophetic significance of our presence in the Middle East. However, um, actually before continuing, uh, these pictures were taken from, from Lebanon, from ecumenical uh, events. Uh, this is here, Harissa, it's uh, Lady Mary, uh, looking at all the Lebanese coast where we really believe in Mary that is, she is protecting Lebanon and St. Chamberlain here. So uh, these, these, um, um, these convictions or this faith is very strong and we needed to stay there and to do our mission and protection. However, we have many challenges. As I told you, we have immigration. It is very high, especially for Christians who want to go and study in the West for education, searching for meaning. However, they take with them their culture and, um, and they fascinated wherever they, they are. We have also socio-political issues. For example, you know, the war, uh, the war in Palestine, the, the war in Iraq, the war in Syria led all Christians to flee to the West, but also the Beirut blast in Lebanon. And all, for example, the, the problems we are facing in Lebanon led to many people to leave and to, to, to live their life and their families against their will. Uh, we have persecution also and violence and martyrdom. As we can see in Egypt, the Coptic church is really a church that is facing till now a persecution also in Iraq. I remember also friends from Iraq, they told me they received from ISIS an envelope where they had a certain bullet so they can tell them to leave or they kill them. So it's really something, um, uh, very, very profound and hard to understand how some people for their Christian identity can be persecuted. Their challenges, our, our challenges also is interreligious dialogue with certain religious communities. It is uh, sometimes bad with the Jews because uh, when, when Israel was created in 1948, it was a huge problem to build bridges, especially because um, uh, the, the conflicts that were happening with the Israeli government, with the, with the local people, uh, Christians and Muslims, was so bad. Till now, also, we have this. So uh, the, the dialogue with the Jews is really difficult, but it's good with, in some areas of the Middle East in, um, with the Islam. Of course. Uh, the challenge could be also the ecumenical dialogue that needs improvement, especially through the MECC that I told you about. And um, sometimes because we have this idea that we are minority in the Middle East, etc., it makes us transform the religious community into a confession. It means like we have a dialogue with the politics, with people in the politics, etc., like back in the, in the second or third century. It, it is something so weird to understand, but it causes problem because some people, they are called Christians and they govern a certain a political Christian parties, etc., and they do not know Jesus, but just because they want to stay here and they want to, they want to defend 
the right of Christians, but they do not know anything about Christianity, for example, or even in the Muslim religion. So we have many challenges and uh, among all these opportunities and the mission and vocation. And finally, concerning our new perspectives, we can see that through economic ecumenical activities like you, like you, you see here in this picture, and also here, we did international ecumenical event back in 2019 with all the Muslim communities in Middle East and all the Catholic and Orthodox and Protestant communities in the Middle East, and we did it in Lebanon. It was amazing. And all people came from Europe who know Tezé. And we did uh, three days of prayers for the unity of the people and the, and the human fraternity, but also the unity of the churches um, in the Middle East, because we can find in Lebanon, for example, a family where you have a Greek Orthodox married to a Greek Catholic, having children who are Maronites. So it's very, it's a big mosaic and we are all one because we look at the same person. The IAB experience for me was a new perspective to be a voice uh, among uh, all my international friends and to, to be really uh, holding this voice of the young people with our challenges and opportunities and also to, uh, to show and to promote the idea that Arabs are also Christians and we have a, a specific reality that we need to promote and we need also the solidarity of everyone and the help of the international community. This makes me talk about the third point of a new perspective is the world, worldwide solidarity and cultural change. Actually in this, I mean that because we are all one, we are all one church around the world, I ask all the people and all the church to think about the politics and how to promote peace around the world because it can influence the political decisions in the Middle East, for example, for the presence of young Christians in the Middle East. As I know, for example, that the geopolitical issues in the Middle East between Iran and the States and, the, and Europe and Africa, et cetera, where everyone is like doing somehow a cold war in the, Middle East, in the Middle East. This can be, for example, influenced by us as Christians if we know how to promote peace and how to create political parties around the world that are somehow rooted in the Bible and influencing other decisions in the world. So by that, I mean, we need the solidarity of all the universal church, but also of other communities. And we can change the culture by promoting peace, love, and everything that Jesus told us to do. Human fraternity, fratelli tutti, and Christus vivi, these three documents are really a sign of hope, a new perspectives in the Middle East. We are reading them and we are trying to live by the spirit of these three documents because um, it's very important to know uh, by reading Christus vivi, our vocation to stay in the Middle East and to be Christians and to have this mission as Fratelli Tutti to build bridges with other communities, but also uh, with the community, with the, all the Christian communities and an ecumenical dialogue, but also human fraternity, that we are one, we are humans after all. And the thing that is common between all religions that we are human and uh, promoting this uh, um, makes us face the idea of differences but promoting the idea of citizenship that we all belong to this area of the world and we want to be Middle Eastern and Arabs and one because we are uh, humans and not because we are different by our faith. So I gathered some pictures here to put um, the signs of hope and new perspectives. Uh, here you have a picture of a pre-synodal meeting that we did in Lebanon where we gathered many young people from all the communities, uh, Orthodox and Catholic people in Lebanon, so we can live um, a synodal process together and think about our vocation in Lebanon. Also here, for example, we had a World Maronites Youth Forum. We gathered all the Maronites around the world, around our patriarch, Amar Beshara Butros Arai, he is here. He is also a cardinal in the Roman Curia. And um, when, when we invited all these people and all the young people around the, world, around the world and all the 28 dioceses around the world in the Maronite church, it was an amazing experience to, to be back to the roots as, as the cedars of Lebanon, as we say um, in the Bible, the cedar of Lebanon has the, um, 
the, the spirituality of the face that can go profound and also can, con can go out with heights actually with, with the face with God. So it is, it is really important. And these events were like a sign of hope in this region. Uh, finally, uh, as you can see here, Pope Francis in, in front of the wall of shame that is done in Jerusalem by the Israeli government, where Palestinians are asking to free Palestine. And you can see here uh, Pope Francis has visit to Iraq, where all the regions were bombed by the ISIS, by Daesh. And Benedict XVI, when he came to Lebanon, and he came also, Pope Jean Paul II, when he came here to, uh, to Lebanon also, so all these events are new perspectives and the signs of hope. And we know that Pope Francis and Pope Benedict XVI and even Saint Pope Jean Paul II, who said that uh, uh, Lebanon is a message. The Middle East is a message of coexistence, of interreligious dialogue, and we, we should keep this. So as a conclusion, I started my PowerPoint by saying that young Christians in the Middle East are the salt and the light of the Middle East because we believe that Jesus wants us to be the church of the Arabs. He wants us to be, um, to evangelize this area of the world, to be um, the, the leaven of the bread of the dough. So um, he wants us with the idea of being a minority, but um, promoting peace and justice. And this is why we carry this mission and vocation till now. And we want to continue with this till the end. So I thank you very much for the invitation. I thank you uh, for all this organization. You can here find my email, my Facebook account, and my Instagram. And I'm so happy to be sharing all this experience with you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Emil. We learned so much from your presentation as well. And once again, just a thank you to all three panelists. I would like to invite you all back into the space. And well, we'll give you a round of applause from wherever we are. <laughs> we really, really appreciate you all and your presence. And so taking advantage that we have such diverse folks with such rich experiences, I'd like to go to the chat and start a Q&A. And just for the audience, if you all have any other questions or even comments, uh, please feel free to drop those in the Q&A section. And so our first question is from Jody, and it says, for Brenda Noriega and others on the panel, what language do you use for international dialogue? To chat your WhatsApp group, do you use more than one language? Do you work with interpreters? And what are the language politics of your dialogue? Who is included? Who is excluded by the language choices you make? And if one of you would like to answer or all of you. Uh, yeah. that's, that's a great question. I can start and then, um, yeah, but I'm, I wish you could see my, my face right now. I don't know why I cannot turn on my camera. I'm sorry, it tells me something about the, like the host. <laughs> it's not letting me, I don't know. Anyways. Um, it is problematic. I'm not going to lie. It's very, very challenging um, the, to manage the languages. We have been very resource, resourceful. We don't have professional translators. We actually sometimes call our friends, you know, especially those of us who come from like very diverse countries. We call our friends and be like, hey, does anybody know like, oh, there it is. Video. Yeah. Okay. I'm back. Um, and so we're just like, does anybody uh, know somebody who speaks English or speaks Spanish or speaks French? But also um, most of the people in the group are bilingual or even trilingual. And Mule speak like five languages. <laughs> and so that is kind of very handy. Um, we use the Zoom that has like a translation. So we know that conversations take longer and it took us about a year to actually um, understand that it, we we were not going to be able to move too fast and that was okay because many times it will take forever to do translations you know somebody will speak and then somebody will like translate but it, we and I will I think I speak for the group but it, say just you guys can say like is that's not true I think we have learned that language is not a barrier but it is an opportunity 
because he, he, he helped us to like move us lower and also to actually pay attention to what the other is saying. When it comes, so we've been resourceable. Uh, we, Emil usually translates in French. You know, we have a, a Beatrice who only, only speaks French and, and uh, English is her second language. English is actually most of her second language, except for our friend from Australia and Joseph from Canada. I think English is their first language. Um, other than that, for the rest of us, English is our second language. So most of the meetings are conducted in English just because most of the people speak English as a second language or is their first language only. So in that case, we're going by majority. Uh, so it gets tricky on that politics uh, of, of language, putting it that way. But we have become very close. Uh, we are very patient with each other and we are resourceful and we just like help each other to, to communicate and we reach out to our own friends. Um, so there's always translation. We have also break into groups by language. Sometimes we just, uh, if we have to talk of, of a specific topic, we do it by language. So we do it in French, English, and um, Italian, no, Portuguese sometimes, but it's mostly like Portuguese and Spanish together. Uh, so you have like Spanish, English, French, and that's it, right, guys? I think those three languages we break by, by in, in teams. Um, so it is difficult, I will say, but I'm gonna open up to Agatha and Emil to add up. Yeah, she answered it. <laughs> no, no need to, to say more, great. And there, there is another question that's somehow connected to that. And so I'll, I'll add in a little bit of that. Uh, Jody mentioned that Brenda mentioned that Pope Francis wanted to speak in Spanish from his heart. What do you lose from your heart and your mind in communicating in other languages? Do you lose anything? And, and how is that? <laughs> Maybe I can take this one. And but I just want to say thank you, Brenda, for explaining the whole thing. It already captures everything, how we have been uh, <laughs> journeying for the past years. And uh, thank you, Jody, for this question. It's actually one of um, a good question that we have been also facing some challenges because even though most of us speak English, but not all of us can understand each other sometimes you know with the accent sometimes with the different uh, you know uh, how how we communicate the, the informal or formal languages on, of english is also one of the uh, challenges that we face and uh, specifically when you ask like what we lose from from our heart and mind is actually the feeling because when you speak one certain language, you have the feeling or you have like some um, things that you cannot describe, but you can just feel that words. For example, in the, the love, uh, the, the word, for example, uh, love, like in my language, we say cinta or sayang. And these are, they have like two different meanings. So when they say love, in English, I don't know whether this love means cinta or this love say means sayang because cinta is like love, love, but sayang is like a, a deep love, you know, like it's a, there's a different rate. And I know in Spanish, you have like many more of this kind of thing. And actually this kind of type of thing is missing that we don't really feel. I can tell you one specific um, example on this. Um, so actually, this is one of the blessing uh, that I could speak Italian. And I, when I translated the Christus Vivid document, I actually didn't translate it from English. I was telling Brenda this story, sorry. I was not translating it from English, but I was translating it from Italian to Indonesia, to my language. Why? Because I can feel what Pope Francis wants to say to young people better in the Italian documents and also in the Spanish document later on when I read it because there are some words or some phrases that can cannot just maybe expressed well in other languages and in that particular language they can like really you can feel what Pope Francis want, wants to say more and I was kind of sad because the the meaning of this word was not translated well in in the other languages so I was very happy that I was given this opportunity to translate so I could translate it, translate what Pope Francis wanted to say 
in my own language. So um, uh, it, 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 this is one of the thing that I that we say also the dichotomy that that there are some parts like of the the, the 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 translation that maybe we can still work on. But um, this is actually a good opportunity for us also young people when we can also have the opportunity to translate quote unquote Christmas with it by using our way of describing or our way of saying what does this document mean with our heart, with our feeling when we read it. So for example, when I translated it into Bahasa Indonesia, because I got that feeling so I can understand or I can choose some words that can, you know, somehow um, have the similar meaning. But how about for the others who maybe don't really understand this and they're losing this feeling? In my opinion, the essence will be the same. But these particular things matter as well. Because sometimes these particular things makes you have, can get this connection with Christus with it. So how you, how you can, for example, see how I can relate to Brenda, how I can relate to Emil, even though we are English is not our first, our languages, but there are some particular words that makes me feel more connected to Brenda and for Emmy. And this is, these are just, these are one of the things that we as the body, the, as the youth advisory body, we are trying to do. Each of us, we are trying to become the bridge to, it, to the others. Like for example, Brenda is trying to become the bridge for our friends from Latin America who speak Spanish and Emil also for our friends in French, uh, to speak in French. I was not, there was not Indonesian there, <laughs> like anyone who speak Indonesian, but sometimes uh, I can, for example, if somebody speak English and it's not really well understood, I can explain in different words, for example. So each of us can also try to communicate and ensure that everyone is not leave, uh, left behind, even though we have different capacity of um, comprehension in languages. Maybe Emil, Brenda, you want to add? <laughs> no, I think it's great. Just to add um, on how we have overcame the challenging of the feeling, because it's true, we lose the feeling. Um, it has been by having some meetings just for social encounters, instead of just talking about business. Uh, we have actually taken the time to get to know each other deeply. Sometimes we we communicate like in one in a one on one. We reach out, you know, and, and we get to know each other, and, and that gives us an opportunity to, to see the person behind the words. <laughs> and I will say that even when we met last year in in Rome, even without the lack of of the feeling, sometimes you can just have the the, the expressions, you know. And there's so much love, but I think it has to do with the relationships we have we have built and I wonder I wonder what would have happened in in dialogue in their national dialogues even in this type of conferences what would have happened if instead instead of of beginning with with business we were to actually begin getting to know each other at a personal level not our credentials not our titles but like what are your hopes and challenges and what makes you cry and what makes you laugh and I think that it has made it for us. Yeah. Great, thank you all so much for answering that. Now I'm going to direct two questions, merge them into one for Emil. And then we have a couple other questions that are more general for all three of you. And so two questions for Emil are, one, are there things that the, things the US does in the Middle East that makes life harder for young Christians there? And two, the second one is um, someone said, I am interested in really and how the current political situation in Lebanon is impacting the young people there. So two and one. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Stan and Bill for these two questions. Um, actually, these two questions are so related because the, the, um, the political situation in Lebanon is so influenced by the geopolitical um, situation of all Middle East, especially with the interference of the United States of America, but also Iran and all the West and the East, as we say in the terminology of the Cold War. So sadly, these 
uh, influences or, or if we can say these interferences in the Middle East are till now present, especially in the, um, in the war in Syria, in Yemen, also in Palestine. So all these problems we are facing is because of big, uh, we can say big countries, but I'm not saying that um, I have something bad towards American people or the Eastern people, etc. It's not about that, but it's for the foreign politics that is um, somehow doesn't always um, answer to the will of the Middle Eastern people, but it answers the will of some people who are governing the world. And this is something bad because, um, for example, if we want gas pumps or we want pet or we want uh, oil or we want something like that, we, we we start for creating some issues around the world, and these issues will lead to will lead to um, have the um, um, have these things uh, answered for these big nations. So. Uh, we are influenced. We are influenced by the U.S. foreign politics, also the Russian one, but also the Iranian one, but the European one too. And it's influencing badly the, the situation in the Middle East. For example, for the U.S., I can say that um, the West part and the East part, the West part is promoting especially the creation of Israel, the, the, having oil and petrol from um, and gas from all this region, but the West also want the East also wants the same thing, and they are using some political parties in Lebanon and all in the Middle East, so they can have their benefits and their interests uh, answered. So, um, and this is creating problem. For example, uh, electricity in Lebanon went off for uh, for decades and. Since the war, we don't have 24, 24 electricity. So we need to have calls with the states to tell them if we can have electricity from Egypt and Jordan, et cetera. But if they're not answered, we should call the Iranians. So we always are dependent of other nations and not self-dependent on what we want and what we do. So our freedom is so determined by these things. And we're not, we're not, fully, we're not fully free to do whatever we want because we have we, we are determined by these foreign politics. For example, voting for a, a president uh, in the United States can influence how the foreign politics can be uh, driven from a certain uh, idea to another one, etc. For example, when uh, the president Donald Trump wanted to change the, um, the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, it was really something so bad to the Christian and the Muslims and the Jews who are Arabs because it is like recognition that Jerusalem is the capital of Israel, et cetera, but also it's an occupation. For example, us in Lebanon, we cannot say the nation of Israel because for the eyes of the Arabs, we do not have a nation for Israel. It's the Palestinian territory is occupied. But all these problems are influencing also uh, because sometimes actually, uh, we want to do this. We want the creation of Israel. We want the creation. We want that uh, uh, we have a certain interest in the Middle East and we want to turn off a certain regime to take another regime uh, into the governance of a certain country. And we do everything to do that. For example, in Lebanon right now, we have a certain inflation because of the exchange currency between the local currency and the dollar. And this is because of the of the problem because we want Lebanon to answer to certain interests from the East and from the West. And because the Lebanese government doesn't want that and they are promoting self-independent, et cetera, and they want also to be free from all these problems and neutral. Uh, so sometimes we have sanctions for that. And this is this led to many people to leave because it's unbearable to live in condition to, to live in conditions that are not for uh, pure human beings. For example, now we have lack of medicine, we have lack of electricity, we have lack of prof health professionals who left the country. Um, we, I, I remember in, in, in last summer, I took four hours to stay in front of a gas station to fill my, my car. It was it is really unbearable and everything is influencing this. And now the war between Ukraine and Russia is, influ is badly influencing all the situation. So uh, Christians 
for this is why actually as a new perspective, I said that worldwide solidarity and cultural change is important because we as Christian around the world, we can have a vote, we can have a voice in the democracy and change a political strategy around the world and lead peace and let peace reign around the world. This is why I'm telling you that there is a mission and vocation for the young people to stay with this, even if we have sanctions, even if some interests of big countries are not uh, answered, etc. So all of this is um, together and interconnected. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emil. We really, really appreciate your answer, your your passion as well. You can really feel that to just Agatha had mentioned that earlier, even with the same language. It's like we could still feel the message. So thank you so much. And a general um, a general question, uh, which I hope uh, everyone has time to answer in these last 15, 16, 18 minutes, um, is a question from Michael. Uh, he asks, can you tell us in what areas or regarding what subjects you find a larger church most unable to listen to the perspective of young Catholics? It can be one of you, or all of you, and then if there's time, we still have about two more questions or whatever it is you would like to share that you didn't share in your presentation. I think I'm a little slow to understand. <laughs> Can you repeat the question? Because I am, is that like areas of like life of the person or, or realities of like, yeah. Can you repeat the question, please, Karita? Of course. Can you tell us in what areas or regarding what subjects you find the larger church most unable to listen to the perspectives of young people? What I believe Michael is asking is, what are the themes that the young people are speaking of or the subjects that the church is resisting? I can, I can try to answer. Um, I think that a, a certain subject that is important right now is ethics and bioethics because the Bible tells us many things about, uh, about values and principles and also uh, a certain law and the law of love and peace and justice, etc. So I think the church somehow, not all of it, but some people governing the church are unable to listen to the needs of young people nowadays, especially regarding everything about sexuality, about um, sexuality inside the marriage, but before marriage, on the sexual education, on bioethics in medical field, do we do in vitro? Do we do we do not do that? Abortion, etc. All these topics, for example, I know them because I'm studying theology, and I was really accompanied by people who are um, doing research uh, around this subject, and I find that this something a certain illumination, and uh, to understand why Jesus said that and how we can use the Bible and the values in the Bible, especially in the gospel. Um, to, uh, to put it or to influence the medical action in healthcare. So I think we somehow we need answers, we need a certain formation and um, health professionals also who are Christian, they are faced to all these questions. For example, if I have my own pharmacy and some people asked for uh, med medicine for abortion, what should I do? Should I say yes? Should the law say yes? Should the law forbid me? So. There are many things that are so controversial because Jesus said we are in this world, but we are not from this world. So how can we do it? Uh, how can we do it in a certain field while using ethics? So I think this is a certain subject that we should be listening to it more. Thank you, Amil. Um, Brenda, Agatha, do you have? Yeah, I think for. I'm going to go in, in, a, in a different direction. I think there are two main topics. The church, um, the larger scale is not listening. And, and, and I'm just going to focus based on what we find or we don't find in Christos Vivid or in other documents. Uh, number one is the attention to LGBTQ young people. 
from the Catholic perspective, um, a real welcoming to LGBTQ people. And then what does that mean? <laughs> That's a conversation, right? Like what the, when we say welcoming, what, what does that really mean? Uh, because I feel young people are talking in a very holistic way. And, and I feel the church is still very limited in, in the way of welcoming. Um, the other one, it's authority and the role of young people in processes um, in the church. And Agatha talked a lot about this. And I think it's completely right. And I feel very appreciated uh, at the larger scale, actually, by, by the processes. We had the opportunity to be part of the opening events of, of the Synod on Synodality. But once we get to the local church, it's different. So I will I want to bring attention not only to the larger church, because that is very easy to say, like the church, you know, and then we forget that the change really happens in our parish, in our diocese, in our organization, in the little bit that we have been entrusted with. Um, but I think for me, uh, one, the factor of authority, definitely the role of women in, in, in the church, the role of the lady in the church, um, and the role of young people in processes of planning process um, and execution as well, uh, LGBTQ, and then, and I'm gonna throw in one more <laughs> to that one, to that pod. Um, I will say, uh, you know what? Um, I will say, uh, oh my gosh, maybe maybe the Holy Spirit doesn't want me to tell to say it. <laughs> I went away. I'm so sorry, but I, let's just stay with us. <laughs> I can add um, a few topics maybe after this, Brenda, like you, th that will come to you, like <laughs> that will come to you. So number one that I want to add also is the topic of secularism. Every time young people say like they are like somehow feel like maybe I'm agnostic or like I don't feel like I don't believe in God anymore. And then the church completely like close the door like no like this is not right like there is like the god and everything but like the reasoning why young people actually have this feeling or maybe they're just like having this confusion or like being in search of their, of their identity having this dialogue this dialogue or this moment of discussion is missing because it's always cut down like no secularism no we are in the spirituality in you know talking about catholic catholicism and this also leads to discussion on uh, topics within our own um, teachings for example why in catholic church we have the the in Indonesia, we call three tunggal, the, the three, uh, God, the, the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit. Why we have three? For example, in Indonesia, because we have like a lot of religions, sometimes you have this interfaith dialogue, right? And in, in other religions, they have like different types of God. And, they, and then we are asked by like these kind of questions, like why your God like died for you? Like, why don't they just like, you know, save him stuff? Like these kind of questions. And when young people want to have dialogue or discussion on this, it's completely like, usually it's like, just look at the Bible, look at what, what the Bible says. Like, it's never like a, a process of like, the young people are given the opportunity to say what they feel or like what they think or the questions that they, they, they raise from that questions. And actually this is why, this is where the, the, the role of accompaniment of the, the, the consecrated ones, the accompaniment of the priests, of the nuns, and even the laity who are taking part in the church itself. These are the part where they can inject us with catechism so the young people can know more about our own teachings. Because like, for example, I was baptized when I was baby. So I, I was not, maybe, maybe I don't have like that much no knowledge of my friend who was, who was baptized when she or he was like, you know, older. So these, this, that's the first one on secularism. The other one is also on leadership. Brenda also already mentioned about this. When we say the young people want to be involved, young people want to take the lead as protagonist. It's written there, like it's everyone say that all the time. But in practice, when we, we say that, it was always like, yeah, but you need some time to reach that. And then like, you have to respect the elderly. There's like this hierarchy and everything. So it's, uh, we feel like there's this, this kind of resistance of how we want to feel. And sometimes this is not 
this is just how we want to express ourselves not to be like granted like oh we want this we want that it's not like the direction we just want to express how we feel and to have this dialogue brenda did that did that come to you like <laughs> It did, if we have time. I think another one, uh, because I, I believe it's very important, is young people with, uh, uh, with special abilities. I don't like to use the word disabilities. I definitely know. Young people with special abilities um, look at the International Youth Advisory Committee. I mean, we love it, but none of us have a physical uh, special ability. Um, and so, or none of us were selected specifically to represent that community. When Christmas of it came out, I actually, and after Christmas came out, but then when the, the news about the committee went out and my picture was there, and then there was like articles all over and mentioning our names and where we were from and all of that, I had some people contacting me. <laughs> I don't know how they found me, but they found me. And they reached out and contacted me and they said, we want you to bring to the table the voice that young people with disabilities are not being heard. And in Christmas of it, it was mentioned once, one sentence in one paragraph. There was not even one whole section for, that, for them. And the people who contacted me were actually parents of young people with disabilities. And then they, they asked me to talk to their children. And that was very beautiful and transformational. But I think that is true. We need to start talking more about young people with this, with special abilities um, and how do we minister to them. And that is just one of, of the different disadvantages that they live on. Because to that, we can add LGBTQ. To that, we can add that they are women. To that, they can add, you know, and we continue adding and piling more identities. Um, but yes, I think I... I I find it very necessary that we mention it. Um, I think even at the post, at the youth personal forum, I personally do not see one young person with physical uh, special abilities. Yeah. I, I want to add something also to what has been said uh, concerning the uh, being an attractive church. I think that uh, since my since my um, working in Switzerland since November, I have seen that. Um, the faith, the meaning of faith doesn't say anything right now to the young people. They have everything in life. Why they do, why, why they want uh, God or they want to believe in him, etc. So it's something, um, I think it's important right now to rethink as a church, what does it mean to be Christian in Switzerland? What does it mean to be Christian in the States? What does it mean to be Christian in Indonesia, etc.? What does it mean? What does being or what does uh, believing in God brings me in life? What does it, what doesn't have some characteristics, etc.? And I think this is something important that we need to look, um, that we need to look after and we need to study because in some regions around the world, for example, in Latin America, in some regions in Africa, in Middle East, etc., and all the in all the regions where we have multi-religious dialogue, etc., we know that. The question of religion and faith is not something so uh, not familiar. It's something familiar because we live it each day. But in countries where we have secularism, where religion is something so deep in us and we cannot expose it, when it's really um, like in Europe, we are um, the word in French is like dechristianating <laughs> Europe, like like taking off Christianity from Europe. In these countries, I think that the church is called to rethink its existence and what it's do, what she's doing in this uh, area. What is she called to do? What is, is uh, her vocation to do? So this is something also I wanted to share concerning young people and the attraction of faith and believing in God. Thank you so much for all your input. And I want to be conscious of the time and we have five minutes. And so we have about two more questions. Maybe um, we can ask one more question and then open up the last few minutes for any last words that you three um, have for our audience. And so a follow-up question to, to this conversation is a question from Bill. What do you think the church should be doing to support LGBTQ plus youth? Brenda, I know you mentioned that. In, in your piece. So I don't know if you wanted to follow up on that or Agatha or Mia wanted to, to add in their input. 
I feel already said a lot. So I don't know if they want to, if they don't want to, I'll address it. But Agatha, Emil. I will just say a bit, but because you mentioned it uh, first, like I will give it to you. But I just want to say that this is my personal um, opinions. And I just want to be conscious of that because uh, in Indonesia, it's, it's, this is something like it's a very dangerous topic and sensitive, but I want to be brave. <laughs> like, I just want to say that uh, this is my personal opinion. I feel like the church has to open uh, itself to this, but I actually, in my, in my position, I agree with Pope Francis. It's actually like, it's not that we agree with this, it, or we support it, but we are opening our arms to our friends from the LGBTQ community because the church is their home. They are, they are welcome to come into church. This is different than just, okay, we agree with this because there was a very big topic in Indonesia does Catholic church support LGBTQ? And there, were, there was the big role of media, how they portray as if like the Catholic church is, you know, having a sense or something. So, so my concern was like, it's, it, the church is the home from them, for them as well. And they should also opening will the welcoming arms of our friends who wants to, who wants to be part of the church. Uh, that's my opinion. Brenda, you have more things to say maybe. Yeah, I think like Agatha said, is, it is a very challenging topic, but one that needs to be addressed. Um, I feel first we need to remove the censors when it comes to the conversation of LGBTQ young people, um, because everybody there is always like, oh, where do I stand? Do I stand with my heart? Like, you know, where is with, with what I'm hearing from young people or do I stand with magisterium, you know, and like, where am I? Um, I think definitely we need more voices. We need to invite more LGBTQ Catholics to committees. And that comes at all levels. So we don't speak their truth <laughs> and we don't bring their voices of our friends. But we have we have those who are going through the experience actually telling their own stories and telling us how we can be more welcoming. I think that will be the first space. Um, but also, um, I will ask for anybody who is in a, in a position, of, position of authority <laughs> to use that power and to start opening up conversations and do it in a very normal way of not of like, ooh, everybody careful because you know, here it comes a taboo, a taboo conversation. Um, but re really opening up the spaces and, and having more intentional conversations, create, allowing more resources coming into parishes, uh, you know, allowing more resources coming into diocese. And I think there are, a lot of Catholic theologians doing a great work on how to provide accompaniment and um, for LGBTQ communities, but how do we disseminate that work and how do we even enter into the sermon instead of censoring the resources right away? We actually come, open, you know, open them, discern them, and provide them, provide them to the to the communities. I think those will be the first steps. Um, from that, I will let people in, you know, who, who are within that community to tell us how all we can be more welcoming. Great, thank you so much. And that, that was the last question and we do not have time for any more, but hopefully uh, you all can respond to these other questions that we have left and maybe we could send an email, not sure, I can't make any promises. <laughs> um, but I uh, just want to say, uh, thanks once again to all the panelists. We appreciate you all so much. You all are inspiring. And we we hope that uh, you can continue to feel supported and know that that the Paul supports you in any way possible in, in your journeys and in your uh, vocation. So thank you all so, so much. And we'd just like to tell the audience that we have one hour of break time and then we have today's last session, which is at 2.30 p.m. Central U.S. time. And the topic is on environmental and sustainable development. Thank you so much to all the participants. And we'll see you back here in an hour. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.